I'm Kathleen Knoth. I'm the library director here. I am so excited for this program. I do want to note a few things. Uh, obviously, you can see we are videotaping um, our digital media arts program. Um, we're very excited to have here um, videotaping this program. So eventually this uh, will be available online. And we also, we have our infamous Robin Collier here from KCEI, which is 90.1. And so he will be um, recording the audio as well. So that will be online um, uh, as well. So, yeah. So happy full moon Friday and happy Cinco de Mayo and happy Water for the People Day. Um, we're very excited. Um, again, this is a book talk, book signing for Water for the People the Acequia heritage of New Mexico in a global context. In the 27 years I've been steering this library ship, I think this is probably one of the most important programs we've ever put on. Um, to say we're honored to have Dr. Jose Rivera and Dr. Enrique La Madrid here to discuss this new book is an understatement. And to have the opportunity to speak with the authors of the chapters um, that include literally those who have their hands in the dirt every day, to some scholars who have traveled the world to study Asakias. Um, they're sitting right here before us. This is icing on the cake. From scholars to our future water protectors, I hope you all got to take a moment to look at the four and five-year-olds, our UNM Taos Kids Campus preschoolers. They did a whole lesson on water and acequias. They've created a diorama. Um, they actually went out to the Land Trust Park um, and got their hands in the mud. Um, and came back and created these images. And I believe some of them will able to visit with us uh, towards the end of the program. And we will also have a, a little slideshow of their videos um, at the end of the program. So some pretty impactful work for our future water protectors. After the book talk and discussion, and I noticed some of you have already um, taken advantage, we were fortunate to have our local opposite bookstore come and uh, bring the books themselves, and we will have book signings after uh, the presentation. I would also like you to check out the, some of the other tables. We have um, partnering with SOMOS here today as well, um, our local literary organization. And um, Judy's here with the Taos Valley Safety Association, so please, um, uh, take a look at her table and some of the information there. Uh, and again, as you might have seen as you walked in, we have a collection of materials from our own college library. And one of the things I like to shout from the highest mountain is the fact that our college library is open to everyone. You do not have to be a current student um, or faculty member. So any of you can get a library card and check out materials from our college library. Um, Part of uh, our connection with Somos is that um, Olivia Romo actually wrote the opening poem in this book, um, Bendicion del Agua. Unfortunately, she's not feeling well, so she couldn't be here today. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that um, you want, might, might want to look at that very, again, impactful poem. Before we move on to the program itself, um, I want to address our UNM Taos land acknowledgement. Um, in mentioning Olivia, I, I wanted to point out the fact that one of the things I've read of hers uh, says that her parents instilled the literacy of the land in her. And so I feel like that kind of goes along with this land acknowledgement. This is something at UNM Taos that we acknowledge and read before every meeting and every program. Um, so the University of New Mexico Taos sits on the traditional homelands of the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo. The original peoples of current day New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo and Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history and work to maintain healthy, fruitful relationships with our neighbors for generations to come. Now to really get this program going, I would like to introduce our chancellor, Dr. Mary Gutierrez. Dr. Gutierrez has been a real supporter of the library and especially for programs like this. So thank you again for being here.
Thank you so much, Kathleen. And I um, will be thanking our authors, um, editors, and contributors, and all of you throughout what I say here today. But I do want to say what an honor it is to have you here with us today. Um, it's an honor and a responsibility that we take very seriously. So thank you for your time, your presence, your thought, your ears, your heart. Water for the People opens with a description of the wasteland that remained after the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fires. The fire started in April, issuing in what the authors describe as the cruelest of springs, a reference to Chaucer and T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland. Eliot's poem also opens in April. He writes that April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. As he continues, Eliot asks, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Eliot addresses humanity saying, son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you only know a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. How different the wasteland of Eliot and the wasteland described in Water for the People. The generations described in this book perpetually know the meaning of life, the meaning of land and water. The people of the water have proximity to the land from history and cultural connection and proximity to the heart, by the heart. They may, like people in Eliot's wasteland, be vulnerable, but they are also resilient, connected to place and ancestors. They have carencia. And through this book, we have carencia. Asequia stories ancient and new, ethics of water sharing, the kernels of democracy. Thank you for allowing UNM House to host this event. Higher education is a critical forum for such conversations, conversations that are crucial and difficult for communities. In this space, we honor voices and perspectives and listen, even when we think we may disagree, and consider a perspective that is new to us or different from our own. And together, we determine the way forward. Especially, thank you, Dr. La Madrid, Dr. Rivera, for your poetry, for your work and your heart. And thank you for sharing it with us today. This morning, I'm filling in for Olivia Romo, La Poeta de la Tierra, with a poem of my own dedicated to her. So I also have, uh, I guess, what you could call an auto introduction. It's, it's nothing from my CV. It's more important than my CV. In the book of life, some of my greatest personal achievements happened here in Taos during the bicentennial summer of 76. I spent every day writing on my dissertation in a one-room playhouse at the residence of the Dominguez family on three acres in Cañon. On the acequia that irrigate, irrigates their fields, I learned how to work with the mardomo, where to put the tapancos, how to direct the water to an alfalfa field, an orchard, a garden, and my pride and joy, a half acre of avas, my suegro, Dr. Jose Amado Dominguez and I planted that were chest high by the beginning of August. That was the summer I hand raised an uraca, a magpie chick that fell out of a tree and that bonded on me and would perch on my shoulder every time I went outdoors. I got together every week with John Nichols and Craig Vincent in a reading group to drink beer and discuss 
Politica. That was the summer that the bicentennial pioneer wagon train was asked to do their uh, American settler reenactment somewhere else. That's when the Parciantes and Ranchos, the Tres Rios Association, united to defeat the Indian Camp Dam. I went to their strategy meetings held in the beautiful Spanish of the Taos Valley, one of the epicenters of my querencia. So there's my book of life uh, CD. Now my poem uh, needs a little bit of background. It's called Madre del Rio. I know it sounds, uh, may sound a little strange uh, in English. You've heard of Madre Veta in the mining, the mother load. We use that in mining in English as well. But uh, here's, here's the background. <clears throat> this poem celebrates the, the successful alliance of North and South Valley Asequias in Albuquerque in a protest of a proposed uh, 2020 transfer of 11 acre feet of water, more than 9 million gallons per year out of the Valley of Greater Albuquerque forever from Algodones to Los Padillas. I'm a comisionado of the Alamos de los Gallegos Asequia Association and signatory to the legal protest quoted in parts in the poem with the strangely archaic legal language that goes stuff like prayer for relief. That's not my language, it's, it's, in, it's a legal term. Albuquerque's acequia systems flow with the traditional democratic government under the aegis of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District to provide water for farms, orchards, urban gardens, and ecosystem services that keep all of Albuquerque green. Unchecked urban growth, water rights speculation, and industrial development erode our water futures incrementally and permanently. In recent years, with the vigilant advocacy of the New Mexico Asequia Association, our state legislature granted Asequia Associations the right to protest out of system water transfers. This right was upheld by the New Mexico Supreme Court. All of the other great oasis cities of Northern Mexico, notably Durango, Chihuahua, El Paso del Norte, now Ciudad Juarez, committed ecocide by removing their urban acequias. Albuquerque's acequias survived because they were defended so passionately for so many centuries. Our entire riparian system with the Rio Grande and its beautiful cottonwood and willow bosque quenches our spirit and inspires us all. So we were on uh, very shaky ground. We could have been countersued, we could, but we held out. We got great advice uh, from the Asequia Association. A big shout out to them. And, and also uh, we have a, uh, an amazing person here, Miguel Santisteban, the first the first director of the Asequias, I mean, of the Sembrando Semillas Youth Program of the Asequias. So I thought it'd be a walking billboard for, for him. So for, and I, be, I begin with one of the slogans of the, of the NMAA. Okay. Madre del Rio, el agua no se vende, el agua se defiende. Keepers of the floodplain, la madre del Rio, as we say, mother of the river, drawing from grandmother Rio Grande, sometimes clear, sometimes red with hemis rains, leaving native flow for silvery minnows, carp and sturgeon, bosque and birds, porcupine and beaver, coyotes and cottontails, sometimes even deer and bear. Deeply quenching alfalfa, maize, maize, and her sisters, calabaza, frijol, her cousin, chile, apricots and plums, apples and pears, mulberries for the robins, pecans for the crows, peaches for all. Primera agua, first water today saturates oasis city, Alburquerque, Albus Quercus, place of white oaks in Western Spain. Beloved Alameda here of Cottonwood Forest, Riverside, Alamos, our desert Venecia, Herons at its gates, 
crisscross canals, alsakia, asekia, water bearers of its heartlands. In days gone by, every year, rising Rio Bravo would flow wild, going wherever it pleased, sweeping us away when rains were more than good. Now that raging spring floods are staunched by dams and levees, we become frontline guardians, defenders of our urban waters. Diverted at Langostura, those narrows below Pueblo de Catistia de San Felipe, through the Albuquerque Canal, through bosques, fields, orchards, and acequias of Algodones, Pueblo de Tamayá de Santana, Bernalillo de San Lorenzo, Pueblo de Tufchurtia, Sandia de San Antonio, through La Rinconada, Alameda, Los Ranchos de Albuquerque, Los Poblanos, Los Gallegos, to my Arboleda and Door. Los Griegos, Los Candelarias, Los Duranes, Los Martinez, Plaza Vieja, and stealthily siphon back under the river west and south to Atrisco, Armijo, Arenal, Pajarito, Los Padillas, and back again to the Rio Grande at Pueblo de Isleta de San Agustin. Of every 10 drops we put upon the land, one goes into crops and canopy, refreshing the land, and nine go into the ground, pumped up to green the heights of the Duke City, where folks turn on taps for thirsty urban landscapes, never a thought to source or flow. In the floodplain below, permission and vigilance reside at the compuerta, the gate of waters. Civilizations evolved along desert rivers, hydraulic authority built on consensus, evolving to nurture land and feed the people. Durango, Chihuahua, El Paso del Norte, the lush oasis cities of El Septentrion, Novo Hispano, Northern New Spain, have all been sacrificed to the chimeras of beneficial use, all turned to dust. Via de Alburquerque, oops. There we go, sorry. Yeah, I was right. Villa de Alburquerque de San Felipe, the only Norteño emerald city left, well worth, worthy of defending, comes now, Enrique La Madrid, this was on the letter, right? Asequia Alamos de los Gallegos, in protest and appeal to water authorities with his fervent prayer for relief from those who would steal the flow away to other points of diversion south of town forever to change water to money and leave our descendants with dust on their lips. Water's ancient ethos is older than Abraham's curse, older than the laws of Zion and Babylon and Medina. Prophets come down from mountaintops to valleys proclaiming unwritten laws of thirst, the order of quenching at desert well springs and rivers, rights of animals, entitlement of plants, privileges of humankind, virtues of sharing al Sakia's flow, cursing water's thieves who would share only bitter drought, all thirst and sand. And that's the river by Las Cruces, through down to uh, El Paso and quite a ways uh, below El Paso. There's a little sewage trickle going down that concrete area. And that's, um, that's what the future looks like unless we keep fighting for what we've got, you know? Que vivan las acequias. Gracias, hermano Enrique. 
Those are just books written. Many of them are in the back table. They're provided by the UNM Taos Campus Library if you want to kind of browse through them. And I was told by Kathleen, library director, that all of those you see in that back table, they're available for checking out. Correct, Kathleen? Yeah, sure. So that's what those books were about. They're in that table. We need, don't need to go over them here. But let me start with this one. This is hugely important, okay? This is the birth of this collection, this anthology of articles called Water for the People, Agua para la Gente. It was on this occasion, September 2014, that the Tribunal de las Aguas de la Vega de Valencia, the water court that has been in session every Thursday at noon without fail for about a thousand years, in front of the Puerta de los Apostoles, the Apostles' Door, at the Catedral de Valencia, the Cathedral of Valencia. Now, it's not the front door. The front door, of course, would be huge and tremendous, you know, like uh, all of the cathedrals in Mexico and in Spain and Peru and other uh, countries. This is the side door, or you know, over there, but that's where the water court meets every Thursday at noon without fail. And so on the occasion of the fifth anniversary that the Tribunal de las Aguas de la Vega de Valencia, the Water Tribunal of Valencia, and the Hombres Buenos, the Consejo de Hombres Buenos de Murcia, the nearby province, the south of Valencia, they achieved recognition in the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage important to humanity. So it was on the fifth anniversary that they were listed on the World Heritage List that they wrote a letter. Where? They wrote it to the New Mexico Asequio Association here in our state. They did not send it to any other Asequia organization, uh, Asequia region, Asequia country anywhere. They wrote it to the New Mexico Asequia Association in Santa Fe. Okay, and they said, come, help us celebrate our fifth anniversary of being on the World Heritage List. And we are inviting you, they said in the letter, because we know of the defense that you have and the protections you know you have in saving your water and saving your acequias. They knew about el agua no se vende, water is not for sale, el agua se defiende, water is defended, it's protected. So that's how they came to invite the New Mexico Acequia Association to be witness and to not just to witness it, but to be honored by the water tribunal that day. September 14th, 2000, I'm sorry, yeah, September 2014, okay. They honored uh, the Osekas by presenting something that they save only in the past, because they have a record of all the things that they do. They present la medalla de honor, the medal of honor, by the water judges to the New Mexico Asequia Association. They usually say, present those to ambassadors, uh, presidents of institutions and universities and large corporations and so forth. But in this occasion, they presented it to the parciantes of New Mexico's Asequia Association. It's a gold medal that uh, I wish we had. Well, it's actually there on the, on the, well, let's see which screen you're looking at. If you look right here, that little box right there in front of the first judge, that's the Medal of Honor. It's now in Santa Fe at the office of the New Mexico Asequia Association. The Parciante next to the water judge, many of you know him. How many people know Don Bustos? Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's a very successful uh, Asequia farmer in Santa Cruz. That's what he calls his place, Santa Cruz Farms. Okay, so he's there. And that was the other honor to receive the medal for the New Mexico Asequia Association in his capacity as the secretario, the secretary of the board of directors at the time. 
But they also honored the Yosekia Association by having the representative, Don Bustos, sign el libro, el libro de oro, the golden book. Again, that's the book that these ambassadors and presidents of institutions, you know, usually sign. Well, here he is. He's not just signing his name. Tradition has it that everybody that's honored in that way signs this libro de oro, uh, just giving their thoughts, their reflections, you know, what they experienced that very moment because the water court has already adjourned at this point. So he witnessed and the rest of us, Hermano Enrique and I were there and Hermana Silvia was also there. Okay, and uh, Santiago Maestas from the South Valley of Seque Associations, he's a member of the board of directors of NMEA, and also Martha Trujillo from Pojuaque, who's also a board member of NMEA. We were all there. And several uh, others from uh, Medanales and other Asequias and, and Cristo San Cristobal, I remember, and others, as well as some professors from UNM and from New Mexico State University. There were about 22 of us. We called ourselves the delegation, you know, of asequeros y académicos there. So Don Bustos is signing that. So that's really what gave birth to this book, Water for the People, because after th that event, and there were other things that happened, okay? You'll read about them in the book. If you read Don Bustos' chapter, he has a chapter. What he wrote in that Libro de Oro, he wrote in our book. Okay, so you'll get to see his emotion about what he experienced and how it affected him to this day. Okay, so you'll have that already. So what happened after that, we all came back uh, and uh, Armando uh, La Madrid, el hijo de Enrique, Armando, Enrique's son, was there too, all the way from Norway, okay, and where he lives. He and Enrique got this idea and they talked to Seth from the Green Fire Times. How many people know Seth in the Green Fire Times? Yeah, many of you, okay. Talk to him about, hey, we need to commemorate. We need to document this huge historical event. We all saw it, it was huge. Sure, for the New Mexico Asequi Association, for sure. But also we thought for the whole state of New Mexico, all of the people of New Mexico should know about this because the New Mexico Secas were the only ones that were invited to be witness to this fifth anniversary and a symposium that was going on at the same time. No others were there. So this put the Asequas, our Asequas, your Asequas on the world stage, because that truly is a world stage. When that water court is in session, and you'll see photographs of it in the book, there's cameras from all over the world, videos and cameras clicking away kids on top of the shoulders of their parents, trying to get a better look at what's going on up at the water court and just taking pictures and filming, you know, hundreds of people were there. So that's the world stage. Armando and Enrique, to their credit, they didn't waste any time. You know, by the next month, October or something, they sent an email to all of us that had been in Valencia and said, hey, we're putting together a special issue of Green Fire Times. Would you like to make an essay or contribution of what you want to put in there? And sure, a number, a number of us did. That was published in February of 2015. Fast forward, another colleague, Baker Morrill from the University of New Mexico Architecture, Landscape Architect Department. Okay, uh, he talked to Enrique and later to the both of us. And he said, look, you folks, you guys, you have a bunch of really neat essays about New Mexico acequias that would fit into our series of ancient gardens of, of landscapes of the Southwest. He's series editor of that at the University of New Mexico Press. He said, I have this series. Here are the titles we have already, others under the way. We'd like to include the Valencia essays in Green Fire Times among those, plus other essays that had been published by Green Fire Times a year before. So there were two major issues already with essays. So Enrique and Armando did just that. And uh, then uh, it became a matter of time of uh, adding additional chapters. We needed a few more to fill out a complete book. And that's the one that you have here at that table. 
So that's, uh, we thank and recognize Baker Morrow for uh, having invited uh, Enrique and myself to be part of that series. And Sonia Dickey, the series editor for both uh, the uh, Ancient Gardens of the Southwest landscapes and Enrique's own series, Querencia, that word we heard already. He's editor of the Querencia series. So Sonia's the head of that in terms of you and Empresso. Thank you both for being here and we recognize you. So with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to Enrique in case he has any additional comments. Um, now it's time for your, oh, for me? Okay. For your chapter. <laughs> now you get them twice in a row, right? Sure. Okay. Uh, I knew he would do better than me on the first slide, right? So, so then, uh, yeah. Okay, I was here. Uh, Amber invited me uh, back in uh, Hispanic Heritage a month. I guess it was September or October or thereabouts. There she is. Yeah, to give a talk, and the book wasn't out yet. We knew it wouldn't come out. We had finished it, done our job, but as you know, there was still a lot of production time and so forth. And so uh, we didn't have the book yet, but I, I did tell Amber, I said, well, look, yeah, I'll be glad to give a talk during Hispanic Heritage Month, but uh, can I talk about this forthcoming book? And I, and I said, she said, sure. So I presented two chapters already and I won't repeat those today. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's copies of one of the books over there too, Las Sanjeras, the uh, Asecas of the Philippines. Uh, and uh, so then uh, at the end of the, toward the end, then we had an advanced copy that UNM Press had given us of the cover of this book, Water for the People. That's all we had. Okay, so I uh, put it on a, on a PowerPoint up here and I told the audience there, you're the first ones to see what this cover to this book is going to look like. And so we did that. Well, today, what I'm doing is uh, they have another chapter. It's about uh, the forest wilderness. Uh, and it's the title of, of the talk is up there, the Trans Basin Diversion in the Forest Wilderness. Okay. Many of you know about the, the famous waterfall ditch uh, in Chacon, in the, the Mora Valley, and the other uh, Trans Basin and Trans Mountain diversions in the Mora Valley, Chacon, Cleveland, and Holman. Okay. Well, here's, here's another one that may, you, maybe many of you may not have heard about. There's another trans basin, trans mountain diversion in Cuba, New Mexico. Okay. Have you ever, anybody here been to San Gregorio Lake? Cuba, near Cuba, okay. A couple of two or three people, okay. That's part of it. This is San Gregorio Lake right here. I like to talk about this acequia because the Nacimiento Community Ditch Association, that's the name of the acequia there, Nacimiento Ditch. They're one of the few acequias that owns and has its own lake. Like Morphy Lake in Mora County, that's another one. Okay, so they have the, their own lake. They built that lake. The ancestors of the current Parciantes built that lake in order to have a storage of reservoir water high up in the what's now wilderness. It wasn't then, this was back in the 40s and 50s. Okay, so they have storage rights there. They built it. But they also lease it and loan it out to the New Mexico Game and Fish as re for recreational uses by the general public. Okay, so that's the importance of uh, Gregorio Lake, uh, constructed initially in the late 40s and then expanded in the late 50s when New Mexico Game and Fish agreed to let them, uh, 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 you know, put the crest higher up, add more storm or water for purposes of fish, wildlife, and recreational uses. So that date is very important. Okay, but so is that other sign up there, National Forest Wilderness. Look at that. When I first saw it, I saw it. It's pinned, you know, it's nailed to a, a huge ponderosa pine there. Okay, I said, what? What's this? You know, maybe I can't go in here. I said, it's closed. Well, sort of, you know, it's just closed to motor vehicles. Even though I wasn't driving, I had already parked the vehicle, but it's a close to motor, vehicle, uh, to motor vehicles and motorized equipment. Area back of this sign is protected by U.S. code, U.S. you know, uh, public law. And look at the bottom: violations punishable. That's how you're greeted uh, when you enter this forest wilderness. I don't know if that sign is still there, but it was there when I I did some field work. Okay, hopefully they've taken it down. 
because of what happened after that. So the forest wilderness there was recent, 1964, okay, by Congressional Act of, to establish the San Pedro Parks Wilderness Area. That's the official name of it because it's on San Pedro Mountains, okay? Well, 1964, that's fairly recent. You know, but clearly it was after San Gregorio Lake. So the customary rights of the Nacimiento Ditch Association, okay, the customary rights were before the establishment of this forest wilderness. They built that reservoir way before. Okay? But even way before that, they built this trans basin diversion and the trans mountain ditch, literally in 1882, way, way before 1964. It was even built, that first diversion at Rio de las Vacas, and also at clear, connecting with Clear Creek, another, another, another source of water, another stream. They built it way before 1964, but way before the Santa Fe National, this is in the Santa Fe National Forest, by the way. Okay. They built it before the Santa Fe National Forest was created in 1915. You know, and even authorities of public domain and set, setting aside uh, for reserves of forested area, even those were, this 1882 was before that, because those were done like at the turn of the century, like 1892 to 1907, something in there, through the Jemez and the Pecos uh, uh, forest. They consolidated that in, into the Santa Fe National Forest is what happened. So here we have important dates. If you keep, keep those in mind, 1964, wilderness. Uh, the late 40s and 50s, the San Gregorio Lake. But before that, 1882, especially that one, because that's when the system, and what does the system do? Why is it called Transbation and Trans Mountain? Well, it speaks for itself. It takes water from one basin and puts it somewhere else. Rio de las Vacas is a tributary to the Rio Gemes. Cuba, the Cuba Valley, the Parciantes of the Cuba Valley, okay, they're on the other side of the Continental Divide. They're the Rio Puerto drainage. Okay, so here you, this trans, uh, the diversion and the trans mountain ditch that's up there literally at the top of the mountain, it takes water out of the Rio Gemes and puts it over to the Rio Puerto. That's the engineering of it in 1882, much like what happened in Chacon and Mora Valley, Trans Mountain Masikias. So that's uh, so that established clearly that the Nacimiento uh, Regantes, the Paseantes of the Nacimiento Ditch, they had customary rights to San Gregorio Lake, clearly, but they also had it to Rio Las Vacas and, and the Clear Creek. Well, what happened in the year uh, 2000, as happened in Taos? and in many other river streams, adjudication, okay? So there it was called the Abuselman case. They go by letter of the alphabet, a gentleman by the last name of Abuselman was the first defendant in the Hemis adjudication suit by the state engineer. The state engineer and the, and the federal government together because it involved the uh, water rights of three pueblos, the, the Hemis, the Zia and the Santa Ana. They had senior rights, of course, you know, uh, original senior rights, first rights. And so the federal government, the US government and the uh, state uh, engineer's office took all the other water rights claimants uh, to court and said, in adjudication suit, you have to establish your, your, your priority date and your water right to this source. So obviously Nacimiento Ditch was one of them. All, all of the defendants uh, in that case uh, were named as, as uh, uh, defendants. There were only 72 of them. No, okay, but all 72, that's their water. Gregorio is their water, La Zaca is their water, Clear Creek is their water. Okay, that's their agriculture. That's their farmland, their pastures, their alfalfa, their gardens that had been in ancestors, you know, down. Okay, so uh, that's the the kind of like the set the setting for the story. To me, the story is about David and Goliath. Who's David? To me, it's the seventy-two parciantes of the Nacimiento Ditch. Who's Goliath? 
the US Forest Service. Not, there's four layers. The Nacimiento Asequia has to work and work through the bureaucracy of the Forest Service. The, there's a ranger district in Cuba. That's the first level of coordination and negotiation. Then the next level, Santa Fe, that's the forest supervisor in the office of the Santa Fe National Forest. Then there's Albuquerque, the regional forester. And then the top person, they call him the chief, is in Washington, DC, head of the, all of the US Forest Service. So that's who the struggle was because the US Forest Service uh, did this. They said, you cannot bring motorized equipment or other mechanical contrivances into this forest wilderness. And the Nacimiento uh, people said, well, wait, we have to clear out the ditch. We need to take uh, our, our backhoes. We need to take our, uh, not backhoes, but our pickup trucks and, and chainsaws because uh, trees and debris and trunks and everything falls into the ditch. We have to clear them out, clean them out every spring for La Limpia. And at other times, there's emergencies that happen even during the middle of the summer. We have to go out there and clean out the ditch from Las Vacas and Clear Creek and the Trans Mountain system itself. So that set up, but the problem was, that was a huge problem already, Goliath against David. But the other problem was who sets the rules? The US Forest Service sets the rules for permits that you might need and they wanted to impose permits, special use permits on the Nacimiento Parciante. They said, you have to have a permit to go out there. You can't do it unless you have a permit. Well, the Nacimiento said, no, that's our customary right. We don't need permits. We've done it for generations, you know, since 18, 1882. So that was the, the issue was here, uh, the, the, the opponent, if you will, the uh, US Forest Service, is one that sets the rules and tells them, these are the procedures you have to pass. And if you don't get approval from the forest ranger, you have to appeal to Santa Fe Regional for the, the Forest Supervisor. If not, the regional forest and so on, up the bureaucracy. It ultimately did go to the, you, the chief in Washington, DC, this debate, did they have customary rights or not? And finally, you know what it took? And, and that's uh, the subtitle when you get to look at the chapter in the book, it's called, Oral history testimony protects the Asequia Bordo, which easement, the easement rights, the customary rights to the easement. Okay. It took the testimony of an elder, Manuel Crispin, who testified that in the 40s, he used to use his pickup truck and other of his parciante neighbors did too, to go out to the wilderness. They used to take chainsaws up in the wilderness in the 40s. And he swore an affidavit he even gave him a map. He traced, well, this is where we started with our trucks and we went up to the head gate of Rio Las Vacas for the Gemes and we came back and we cleaned it out. That's, that's his testimony. It took years before the Forest Service uh, acknowledged and accepted his testimony, but they did eventually. So that's the, the end of the story. At the end, the Nacimiento Ditch Association uh, was recognized that it in fact did have customary rights to enter the wilderness they still have to coordinate, of course, and they have to have an annual plan, but they don't have to apply for a permit and get permission, so to speak. So that, that is uh, the victory that uh, they uh, uh, you know, uh, concluded finally in 2007. It took many years, by the way, because uh, during the period that they were uh, redoing their diversion at Clear Creek, the main one that connected Rio Las Vacas with their Nacimiento system down below in Cuba, they needed to modernize that ditch, that diversion, that presa, so as to be measured. So now they have to measure their water and that was fine with them. But during the time they were constructing that diversion, the Forest Service imposed these rules and they said no. So they had to take uh, cement bags, sand, rocks, uh, vigas by uh, a, a wagon, horse-drawn wagon with rubber wheels and on horseback, they had to pack the horses with you know, equipment and materials to take to remodernize their ditch. So that was a huge, a huge obstacle. At one time, not even wheelbarrows were allowed because they're defined in the Forest Service Handbook, if you ever read one, which I did. Wheelbarrows are defined as mechanical contrivances, you know, because they're they have, you know, they you have to do some, a human has to push it along. So anyway, so they finally, so that's a huge victory for them. Uh, they're having an annual meeting in, in July 
and uh, they've been invited uh, invited me to go give a talk over there. So I'll be doing that, and uh, maybe Andre can join us too. Thank you. Yeah, then next up, I'm sorry, I'm the one in charge here. <laughs> now, the next, now, the other chapters, you've got mine already. So then we have uh, Arnie Valdez. Uh, he's got the, uh, no, I'm sorry. No, wait a minute. You know, it is Valdez, but it's uh, about Valdez here in Taos. Uh, the Aceques of Valdez, Placita Merced uh, by uh, Silvia Rodriguez. And then it'll be Arnie after that. Thank you. Anybody here from Valdez? This is dedicated to you. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Taos Basin first. Put up your hand and look at it as the river system of the basin of Taos. Your thumb is the Rio Grande del Rancho watershed. Your index finger is the Rio Fernando watershed. Your middle finger is the Rio Pueblo watershed. Your annular figure is the Rio Lucero watershed. And the little finger is the smaller Arroyo Seco, which feeds the village of Arroyo Seco, but needs to bring water from the Rio Lucero because its own waters are insufficient to irrigate all the acreage. Now, there's another part of this uh, anatomy, which is a whole other river north of that, and that's the Rio Hondo, which is its own watershed which originates below Wheeler Peak. One of its sources is Williams Lake, but it is also fed by springs all along. It's actually along all, the whole length of the river. Um, many of the river actually runs underground for several miles and then emerges in springs just at the headwaters where Towski Valley is now, like, now located. Now, the valley was settled uh, in the late 19th century, as far as we know, although clearly yeah. to do... Though, uh, I'm going to try to keep the time here. That's the, amplifying. that's the amplifying. Okay. Certainly Taos Pueblo had already done at least horticulture in that valley. Um, but in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it began to be settled by pobladores pressing north from the center of Taos. Um, and uh, the land grant date, which was probably follows where people were actually beginning to settle and divert water off the Rio Hondo, is 1815, which is the Arroyo Hondo land grant. And uh, the, the long watershed, of course, do we have? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, we don't have a map of the watershed. But anyway, um, Towski Valley, which was once a mining camp, runs about nine miles down. And then the canyon opens up into a beautiful valley, which is the Arroyo Hondo Valley. The upper part of that is the Valdez Valley, originally known as San Antonio. Then it comes to a kind of a pinch of bluffs, which geologists call the Gates of Valdez. And then it opens up into the broader, longer Arroyo Hondo land grant valley. For reasons we don't know, um, people in Arroyo Hondo uh, is, I guess, we guess, uh, moved upstream and established the Placita de San Antonio, the date of which is 1823. The valley is one of the most picturesque scenes in the Taos area. It's a favorite of the artists. The early colonists used to go up and paint sharp, all of them, the twining uh, canyon. And they would have some of their uh, Taos Pueblo models arrayed against the Aspens in traditional gear. Uh, also, the view of Valdez from the rim, uh, which you get a sense of here, is very picturesque. I even brought my pointer. You see this? You see this from the rim. So Valdez, the drop, Valdez is really in this deep little emerald cleft, this wedged between the northern hillside that rises into the Sangre Cristos and the rim, which is a drop of about 300 feet. And the top of the rim, the mesa there is known as Desmontes, which is actually a suburb of Arroyo Seco, uh, in fact, and was settled probably as Arroyo Seco spread, uh, spread westward. Uh, so Valdez is in this deep little embrace 
on the one hand of the of the hill going into the mountains and of the rim on the other. And it's a beautiful little micro basin that um, illustrates perfectly the settlement pattern, the colonial settlement pattern, um, with the long lot stretching between the river, which bisects the valley, which is only about two or three miles long. Um, and then across the base of the valley are these long lots. And these are the farming lands, uh, the irrigated lands along the north side of the valley, of the, along the hillside is the Aseque de San Antonio. That's the ditch that I irrigate off of, of which I am a commissioner. Uh, at the head of the valley, these two uh, uh, acequias diverge, one along the north side and one along the south side. The south side is the Prando. Um, they both re-enter down below the San Antonio at the base, really almost at the end of the valley, and the Prando has its desagüe a little bit above that. In the center of the valley is this enclosed placita, this beautiful enclosed placita, which is still intact uh, ar uh, architecturally and is still settled by some of the early families, the herederos of the land grant. Um, and then, of course, you go into the longer and possibly, in some cases, more famous village of Arroyo Hondo. But the Valdez um, has this hydrology of these two ditches that go run, run alongside of each other. Um, and if you look at the valley from the rim, as most people do, you see this picturesque little you know, perfect little micro basin with a beautiful enclosed pasita in the center. If you descend into the valley, the view is completely different because you're looking up at the rim and the mountains and something that you see from the rim, you don't see from inside the valley or the road uh, that passes by it, which is the placita, which is sort of, I call it the sequestered placita. It's actually the only intact, that is by that I mean non-gentrified. It's the only placita in the Taos area that has not been gentrified. Let me get some to the character of this community. Now, even though the valley looks pristine now, um, some would argue that of all the watersheds, except perhaps for the, for the Rio Grande del Rancho watershed, it bears the heaviest industrial footprint that is in some sense, in, in some cases, invisible. First was, of course, uh, just below Valdez um, at Canoncito, where the little bluffs pinched together, was the Turley Mill uh, uh, still and that produced famous Taos lightning and had all kinds of concerns going on, uh, probably sheep herding uh, still. It was also a, 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 a place where a lot of goods coming across the Santa Fe Trail and they'd make a detour to avoid customs or its equivalent uh, were deposited at Shirley Mill. So there was a wealth of stuff there that was being opened up from the West. And when you talk to people in Valdez today, they say, oh, it was like Walmart, there was everything there. But it was producing um, uh, the most famous liquor, which of course liquored up that era of Taos and the, uh, the, the trappers. Um, some believe that the area of Desmontes above on the rim, which was covered at one time covered with trees that were all cut to feed the mill. The young archeologist who did his dissertation on Turley Mill, the ruins of which incidentally sit on the land of the late uh, Donald Rumsfeld, um, <laughs> the, the, the footprint of empire uh, and the footprint of industry is well felt in the Valley of Valdez, even it has this pristine appearance. Anyway, uh, young Albert Gonzalez believes that at that time, which is like the 1820s, 1825 when Turley Mill was really going strong, there would have been a tower of smoke from the constant burning uh, that would have been visible from everywhere in the Taos Basin. Anyway, uh, as you know, the 1847 revolt, um, which scalped the first American governor in Taos and was some kind of coalition between Taos Pueblo and Nuevo Mexicanos or Mexicanos at that time, uh, then went north and sacked and burned Turley Mill and murdered someone and one of his neighbors murdered him uh, in the hills. Uh, that was the end of that particular industrial era. era. After the Civil War, um, a lot of miners came into, uh, into New Mexico. And I'm told that in the late 18th, early 19th century, there were at least 100 mining claims, 1,000 mining claims in the hills above Valdez. That's when Twining uh, and Amazette were established. And there was a mining boom, gold, copper, various things by 
large, largely instigated by Americans and some Europeans uh, that boomed and then busted. And one of the famous characters in that, of course, is Willie Frazier, uh, who still has descendants, uh, who claims some descendants from him in the valley, uh, who actually started a toll road and had this dream that it would be one of the major mining areas. And he had all kinds of equipment uh, strewn all over the hills. And a lot of the hillsides were actually uh, really changed in many ways that you wouldn't recognize today. So the footprint of mining uh, in the valley is largely, unless you have a tutored eye, unless you know what you look, look for, just like archaeologists see things the rest of us don't see, geologists see things the rest of us don't see, uh, because it busted and the, the, abandons, the, the mines were abandoned, the hills were abandoned, and a lot of the equipment that was left has, has been uh, salvaged and repurposed, you know, as planters in people's yards or whatever. Um, the third industrial footprint, of course, is the ski industry, which became uh, established in the late 1950s and today is growing at a breathtaking rate. Um, the character of Valdez, I think, is interesting because uh, I grew up in Taos and uh, in, right in town. And back then, as Carmen would re remember, there weren't any, anything to do really, except go town on, go park on the plaza and watch tourists. The other thing might be to take a drive, uh, you know, go uh, puebliando, uh, take drives around the area to the little villages. And we did that on Sundays and we would start at twining and have a picnic and then um, drive along. And Valdez was famous for two things. Uh, at that time. One was that there was a ditch, not the San Antonio or the Prando, that ran uphill. And that's the Cuchilla ditch, which now diverts itself above uh, the other two ditches, at the, just above the mouth of the canyon. And it's, it was like this miraculous ditch because it rises 300 feet to the mesa. And uh, different, uh, Taos Pueblo claims they dug it. Uh, different people claim they dug it, uh, but it was a marvel of engineering and it was probably done with instruments. Uh, uh, and I believe certainly later than 1815. Anyway, uh, there was that. The other thing that, uh, three things that it was famous for. The other was its beautiful orchards, which you still saw tr uh, traces of in the upper valley. Fruit, that uh, was famous for its fruit. And the other thing were brujos. It was famous for brujos. Um, and uh, my father would drive us along and we'd look in down and watch the ditch run uphill. And then he would tell us how at midnight on Friday, you would see these balls of fire hurtling across the valley because that's when the brujos had their conventions. Uh, we also had distant kin uh, in Valdez um, that he, he knew and we would sometimes visit. I wasn't, it wasn't until I was in my middle thirties that I actually set foot inside the hut the hidden placita. Um, and then I learned that there's actually a, a ditch that runs right through the cantina there. Um, Valdez has a reputation for being very conservative and very closed to outsiders. Um, and of course there's the ditches and its nickname is La Plaza Rota, uh, which some say derives from when the bell was being cast for the capilla, the duendes or the brujos cracked it. Uh, anyway, I think in many ways it looks like a Plaza Rota because it's not gentrified, but I think in many ways spiritually and socially it's the least broken of the Placitas in the Taos Basin. Um, Valdez, maybe because it's small and it's poor and it lives in this embrace, uh, has a kind of cohesion uh, that I find extraordinary. Uh, of course, I have now become, a, as I like to say, a permanent guest uh, in, in the Valdez Valley, even though I have kin there. Um, it's my adopted home because I grew up in the plaza and I grew up on a ditch that no longer exists. And I've been associated with Valdez for, for many years uh, as an adult, but knew about it as a child. And I've uh, I'm living there. And it seems to me that there's a character in Valdez, which on the one hand is one of solidarity and unity, but deep resistance. Deep resistance to encroachment, particularly of development. Uh, it lives, talk about David and Goliath. This is the classic story of David and Goliath. Um, Valdez, I got first personally involved in Valdez as an adult back in the 1980s when the community rose up and refused to accept 
uh, a major subdivision uh, that had transferred water rights from the ditch to underground to be built in the upper valley. That's a long story. It became known as the Condo War. I've written about it in detail. But one of the things I learned then uh, was that Valdez, even though this, everyone will hear will have a story about the deep resistance of Nuevo Mexicano acequia land grant communities and the tenacity with which they hold on to what they have, as well as the challenges that conspire to evict them, to dispossess them, to gentrify them out, to take their water, to transfer their water to development. The story of Talpa right now uh, is, is a similar one. Uh, Taos is right now in a new phase of the what you might call the enclosure of what's left of the commons. And the communities are, are, are resisting it as they always have. They learned maybe perhaps some of this from Taos Pueblo, of course, which has resisted uh, incursions and assimilation for 500 years and is itself an iconic uh, representation, talk about land recognition here, of, of uh, endurance um, in the face of enormous onslaught. Um, you have in Valdez intact, of course, the Placita. You have the Ezequiel system, which is pretty intact and works pretty well. Um, you have a land grant. There are three really uh, more or less functioning land grants in Taos. I would argue that the most functional, the most active, uh, the most cohesive is uh, the Arroyo Hondo Arriba community land grant of Valdez. It's, it's somehow separated off or became independent from, or even perhaps was granted independently from the Arroyo Hondo land grant, which exists in name only in terms of having a, a board of directors, bylaws, but no land. La Serna has lot, stretches of land, lineas all across uh, ranchos, all up into the, uh, almost to the Picaris area, lineas, but it doesn't really act, uh, operate as a unified whole. Um, I think this interrelation between plaza, land grant, uh, and acequia, and, because they're the same people, uh, and then, of course, the mutual domestics are an important element of cohesion. And then there's the morada, and that's a whole other story that there's not time to go into, which was sold to an outsider, but in some way seemingly miraculously re recaptured, reacquired only a few years ago by the land grant and restored grassroots up, no top down. The church didn't do it, the historical society didn't, the local people did it. Um, let me just end, last night, uh, three generations of Valdeños, uh, the commission of the Acequia de San Antonio, a representative of the mutual domestic, and some representatives of land grant met in the Escuelita, right in the center of the plaza, right below the, uh, the, Ase the, the Cavilla de San Antonio with the CEO of Towski Valley to talk about the river and to talk about what's happening and what the future is of that watershed as you build a resort city for the 1% to, for them to enjoy a sport that will be extinct in 30 years, in which uh, a resort modeled essentially on Vale or Aspen is being squeezed into a much smaller, much more fragile alpine environment. At a time of mega drought and climate change, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, now we'll have the other Valdez. <laughs> Colega, amigo, Arnold Valdez from San Luis, Colorado. And he'll talk about the study that he did about La Bajada this is also suggested by Baker Morrow way back when we started talking about it. It was one of the first examples you gave us, Baker. Hey, you know, Arnie should do a, a essay about that. So here he is. Thank you. Um, I, as uh, Jose mentioned, I'm from San Luis, Colorado, probably the only non-New Mexico author of, this, of the chapters. But at any rate, uh, <clears throat> like I always tell people, uh, we're occupied New Mexico up in the San Luis Valley. So we're still culturally a continuity of the, of the landscape. Um, 
Um, I started uh, teaching at UNM in 2002, and it was an interesting experience because I first got interested in teaching uh, when I met my professor, Chris Wilson, who encouraged me to attend UNM. And so uh, at that time, I was living in San Luis, but I really wanted to finish my degree. I'd started at the University of Colorado, but that just wasn't working out. So I was commuting actually to take his class. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning just to drive all the way to Albuquerque so I could get there by eight o'clock so I could teach my class at the UNM School of Architecture and Planning. The first course that I taught was alternative energy, um, alternative materials, uh, methods and materials, which is Adobe, um, straw bale, and all alternative methods of construction. And then in 2003, I started teaching cultural landscape planning. And that was a class that was um, inclusive of looking at the landscape, the built environment, how did it come to be? And so we were looking at different examples. And so these were all student projects for the most part. Um, there was lectures in the courses and then we would do field work. So this is how I got interested in, um, in some of the field studies that were going on. In 2007, I started working for Santa Fe County as a senior planner. And so that kind of um, correlated nicely with my work at UNM because uh, during the, um, pl the planning work and School of Architecture work, there were always uh, good examples or field studies that could be looked at for, for student projects. And so uh, when I started with uh, UNM, with, the, <clears throat> with uh, Santa Fe County in 2007, um, I was assigned to work on community-based projects to help with agricultural related projects and um, other kind of cultural projects, um, anthrop anthropology, ar archeological type of uh, studies. So this is where I got interested in La Bajada. One of the first things I did was look at the maps in Santa Fe County. And it was interesting because when I looked at the map, I couldn't find La Bajada. I knew it was there. And I knew uh, it was um, a really intriguing community to me because every time I would be driving, as soon as I got out of Santa Fe and I started dropping down to La Bajada, it was very obvious, um, you know, the, the transition from uh, upper Rio Arriba to lower Rio Arriba. And so that was very intriguing. So when my planning work started, um, I asked the planners and, and the head of the department why it wasn't there. And they said, well, it's there, but it just hasn't been represented as a community um, integral to our planning process. And so I said, can we start doing that? And so um, we did, and I was sort of assigned to work on the project. Uh, also during that time, I got connected with the, um, uh, the National Park Service. They were based in Santa Fe, and they were also doing studies on uh, the Route 66 corridor. In fact, one of the first documentations that led me to La Bajada was to do a, a study with uh, students on the, the cultural, uh, the corridor of, of La Bajada, which included uh, studying historic trail alignments of the uh, Camino Real, um, Highway 1, and, uh, <clears throat> and then the, the context of the village uh, within that. So um, during the time of, um, of these studies, uh, the community became aware that Santa Fe County was already, you know, was interested in doing some kind of a planning process. So we were approached by a contingency of community people from La Bajada that came and had a meeting at the, at the planning office and they invited us to go out and do a, a, a tour and a site visit. So we did, a couple of us went out there and we looked at the landscape and definitely it was amazing. It was just magical and, and, and its components. Uh, the village itself is, um, is a spectacular setting. It's sort of like a little oasis. The only drawback is that it's located right at the very end of the Santa Fe River. It's the last community. So they always end up getting a trickle flow of, of the water that's in the river. The, the water flow for the most part has been intermittent. The only thing that kind of saved La Bajada were some of the uh, spring flows. There was a historic spring located in La Boca, the mouth of the, uh, of the Santa Fe River, just a little bit above the village. And that was a very prolific spring that was located right by the river. And so that kept bubbling up, uh, feeding water to the river. It was also a site where Native American communities from on top of the Mesa of La Bajada would come down to gather water. And uh, historically, there were pueblos there. There was the Pueblo Quemado, which is now known as the Bajada Ruin, which is right at the base of the, the Bajada village, just a little bit westerly there. Um, and as you traverse the canyon, it's amazing. It's full of uh, pictographs and 
all sorts of evidence that was left there by uh, you know Spanish colonial explorations, Native Americans, indigenous communities. So it's just uh, full of, uh, of cultural artifacts uh, in addition to a spectacular setting of the river and the springs. So um, La Bajada was documented in the late um, 1700s by the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. They found that there was a church there, uh, San Miguel. And so shortly, um, uh, and then during that interim is when the village was being um, established. And of course, the Aseca was also being dug during that time to provide water for the community. The community is a traditional um, Hispano community based on the, the concept of the river, the long lots that lie, that lie perpendicular to the, to the river, and uh, the same type of uh, setup as most of the indigenous communities up here in the north um, with the adobe for the architecture and uh, just a cultural landscape that fits in with the context of the land and the use of local materials. So um, <clears throat> the, the Aseca developed during that time, and then during the territorial period, um, from the 18, uh, 1828 to 1850s, around that time is when there were a lot of changes that were starting to happen. Uh, the railroad was one of the major changes. Um, the late 1800s, the Atchison Topeka Railway came in and they discovered the spring uh, that was there at the, at, the, at the base of the La Bajada, just into the canyon, uh, the very prolific spring that was bubbling all this water. So they tapped into it, they actually put a pipeline and they took the water to Santo Domingo to feed a small community of Wallace. And they also had uh, the big tanks where they would fill them up with water for the railroad because there was no water source. And so this is an amazing engineering feat of having to tap into the, um, the spring and then with a pipeline, run it all the way to, um, to Santo Domingo, which is several miles away. So that was working to supply water for the railroad. Meanwhile, the community was being, um, um, was being cut short of their water rights. Uh, there was no official regulatory um, process for regulating water rights, probably not until after the, uh, the water code was established uh, early uh, in the 1900s. But prior to that, it was a very loosely organized. Communities organized themselves and they did their own thing. But there were also all these interventions from the outside and as Sylvia mentioned, developers came in they took advantage of the water source, they tapped into it. And then the community later on started protesting. So then in order to appease the community, they said, well, um, I guess we did take some of your water rides, but um, what, uh, how does it sound like if, I, if we give you a pipeline for your community? So they said, well, I guess something is better than nothing. They didn't concede to uh, uh, the fact that they had water rights that belonged to the community, but they recognized that they were impacting the water rights. So they put in a pipeline, they tapped into the, the spring and they developed, it's called a gallery. They dug like a big uh, uh, pit, it's called an infiltration chamber. And then from there is where they were able to tap um, the, well, that's where they were tapping the water for the, for the railroad. And this ran through a trestle right across the landscape. In the book, there's a picture of the, of the trestle. Uh, again, a, a very amazing feat because it was being driven just by gravity, just by the height of the elevation. So they put in a pipeline for the community. The pipeline was initially established through the bed of the Santa Fe River. And that functioned uh, efficiently for many years. It, uh, it was buried right in the bed of the river. That was the easiest way to, to bring it uh, without having to traverse the landscape and you know elevation drops that were there. So they brought the water to a little cistern that's right at the bottom part of the community. And so they filled that up with water and then the community would draw water from there uh, for their needs, um, as well as drawing water from the Santa Fe River whenever it was available. Um, so that, uh, that went on for a while. And then um, I think in the, Mid, mid 50s, well, probably later on, uh, I forget the date, but anyway, the, the city of Santa Fe started discharging uh, wastewater, treated wastewater into the Santa Fe River. And so at that point, uh, La Bojada became aware that, um, you know, there's gonna be a problem here with our pipeline running down the, the stream bed and this, uh, you know, treat, supposedly treated sewage water being released in there, it doesn't sound like a good, uh, a good deal. So, uh, so, so what they did later on is they, uh, they rerouted the pipeline to go more or less um, kind of parallel with the, uh, the trestle pipeline that was there for the railroad. 
Um, and eventually uh, the, the trestle um, pipeline was abandoned when the railroad folded. Uh, they pretty much uh, gave the, uh, the assets to the community of La Bajada, so they now control um, the pipeline and the right to the water system. The only thing is with La Bajada, it's sort of landlocked because it's, it's sitting right in the middle of, of uh, the reservation, Santo Domingo Reservation, and then uh, further down, uh, there, there's the other, uh, the other reservation. So they're sort of landlocked. Even the road is a tribal road, and so they've had a lot of trouble um, having to access a community. And then there's a lot of threats also to acequias in the landscape, just from tourism. A lot of people like to go and um, go up to La Bajada Cliff and hang glide or take their motorized vehicles, that sort of thing. So the Forest Service is working on a, a management plan for that part. And then Cochiti Pueblo also owns part of, the, uh, part of La Bajada. So they've sort of got their part closed off. Then the Park Service has the other part that's up on the top. Um, so anyway, uh, it was just a, an amazing uh, experience documenting um, La Bajada um, landscape. Uh, what the students did is it took about two or three years to complete the study um, because there was a lot of work to do and we only had limited time during the semester. So after about three years uh, in conjunction with the National Park Service and the Historic American Engineering Record, which is here, we were able to document La Bajada, Sequia, and the community water system uh, and produce drawings and a report um, that has now become a permanent archive of, of the Library of Congress. So um, uh, I'm excited to say that UNM helped with the, um, uh, the, um, the documentation of, of La Bajada, but even prior to that, we also did La Cienega, Sequia, which was also maybe the first documentation that went into the Library of Congress. So New Mexico now has two solid Aseki documentations and you can go to the Library of Congress website and look at the drawings and the report. They're available for, for public domain. So um, just a very exciting effort to document um, the work. Um, I myself am, am an active Aseki participant up in, in, uh, in Southern Colorado and I'm currently involved in documenting the secrets of the Upper Rio Grande, I'll be doing some work on that for uh, some future work in a publication. Um, so that's what I'm doing now, but um, during the process, um, as I sort of retired from my work at UNM in Santa Fe County, I'm back in San Luis farming, irrigating. In fact, last night I was irrigating by moonlight, very magical, mystical experience just to, <laughs> be out there and to see the water running, the little rose just uh, shining with the moonlight and very exciting, very magical. And it's just so exciting. And uh, um, I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of the, the publication. And I look forward to uh, continuing my work in Colorado and also in uh, New Mexico. Thank you. By the way, Arnie Valdez and Maria Mondragon who's here are excellent gardeners and farmers. They have just a, a variety of crops that they grow in San Luis, including uh, one of my favorites is bolita beans. <laughs> okay, next up is talking about food, uh, cultivating a sensible food system by uh, Miguel Santisteban. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I love these kind of talks, you know, um, sitting on a, on a panel with people who are responsible for me being here. Um, I've known Dr. Rivera since the beginning. Uh, Dr. La Madrid knew me since I was in diapers. And, uh, and Dr. Rodriguez and uh, Mr. Valdez there, Dr. Valdez have... Uh, you know, mentored me along in this process. So I almost feel like I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have anything to say if, with, if I didn't experience your generosity when I was uh, ripe for learning. I hope I'm still ripe for learning. But, um, you know, and you heard a lot of history. And of course, for me to get into that, I was in this topic, I had to get historical you know, they say uh, a person doesn't know where they're going if they don't know where they've been. And so, but my my contribution was more looking into the future and uh, and trying to see how we're going to pull through some of these factors that we talked about, you know, drought, development, 
gentrification and uh, water rights, all these impacts we see to the acequia. So I explored that in my chapter. It was initially for the Green Fire Times that I wrote this article. And, uh, and you know, in writing, there's a lot to write, but you only have so much space and time. So I would like to invite you to my blog, which you can find at uh, solfelizfarm.org or growfarmers.org. You know, I, the original article is almost three times as long and, uh, and really fleshes out some of these ideas. But uh, in the article, I really looked at, you know, how the acequia traditionally functioned to provide food for the community and what all that looks like. So first of all, you know, that um, requires the functioning of an acequia and the bringing of water to the landscape. But that water is coming to us from the upper watershed. So the upper watershed and the land grant system you heard about um, were central to the sustenance of the community in terms of, you know, gathering wood, fuel for houses, uh, building materials, medicinal plants, hunting, fishing, and maybe most importantly for food security, grazing. Uh, and back then we were more uh, sheep and uh uh, sheep ranchers than cattle and uh, and that was lighter on the land and then we kept them moving but we had um, the relationship and the authority the connection to the upper watershed something that was taken from us with the coming of the United States and whose pressures we're still feeling if you go in the newspapers earlier was mentioned what's happening in Talpa you know it's almost like um, they don't want to leave any part of the upper shed, watershed undisturbed or for community use. And that part is central to how we could actually sustain ourselves because as uh, you look into the ecology, which is that's my master's degree, you look into the ecology of how humans relate to the environment, you know, you start start to ask questions about how we could actually sustain ourselves within the environment. And I believe that, you know, in these desert environments, high desert environments here that we find ourselves in Taos in Northern New Mexico with the acequias um, are the perfect and best example of how you can provide food and cooperate in an environment that, you know, um, can be defined by scarcity can be de defined by unpredictability. And that's the kind of thing that we're seeing with climate change. So it's disheartening to see that, you know, we have to struggle so hard for our survival and legitimacy in the modern day political and economic and uh, recreational context. And, uh, and at the same time, some of these people who are exerting pressures against us would call themselves progressive lib liberals and trying to solve these problems that they're helping to exacerbate. So that said, you know, I um, had to look at, at what was the best and greatest of Asekia culture that I found, you know, to sustain this community, uh, to sustain people in this marginal environment. And, uh, you know, to cut to the chase, um, you know, I have a picture here of uh, some legumes that came from the Middle East, you know, lentils, garbanzos, fava beans, and, uh, and peas, alverjón. And these crops are all frost tolerant. They're all drought tolerant. And, uh, and though not traditional to this area, you know, here, uh, the, I don't know if this is rye or winter wheat, but uh, the winter grains, rye and winter wheat, you know, don't require a lot of water and you can plant them in October and, uh, and they get irrigation from the snow. So, you know, I make the argument that if you're willing to eat lentils and rye, you know, you can stay here when the times get really tough. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to bet a lot of these people who are making these grandiose plans or, you know, have a, a shorter time span here when the times get tough 
you know, people from the Pueblo could tell you, you know, that they've weathered all kinds of tough times. And for people who call this home, there's nowhere else to go. So, you know, a lot of us are going to be committed to this place and, uh, and to making it work regardless of, of what the labels are. You know, I take a difference with the term mega drought. Last year at my farm uh, with my weather station, I measured almost 16 inches of precipitation. And, uh, and I grew plenty of crops. I think they apply these labels to create, you know, attention or some type of political agendas or to instill fear, you know, or mostly to detract from the fact that we're living an unsustainable uh, economic lifestyle and they don't want to call that out. They'd rather blame it on something that seems external. But in actuality, I found there was plenty of water to grow what I needed to grow. You know, I can't make money off of lentils, but I certainly can save seeds and feed my family on very little uh, effort and very little water. And then, um, so looking at the totality of Asekia culture and how it was practiced, I think, like I said, is the, is the best model for sustainability we have. So I tried to articulate that in this chapter and to, uh, to educate as to what that is. Because there's a lot of misconceptions about what agriculture is in general, and especially Asekia agriculture and what agriculture needs. You know, I would argue that all the corn that's being uh, grown in the United States is using too much water. And any Hopi or native farmer could tell you that, that that much far water is just not needed for crop production. But the problem is, is we have policies such as use it or lose it that uh, encourage uh, our farmers to be wasteful. And um, so how do we get beyond all that? So, um, you know, an expansion of this chapter is to figure out, you know, of all the calories and protein we used to get from the upper watershed, you know, that are now uh, ski areas, mountain bike trails and uh, tourist condos, you know, how are we going to make up for that? And the good news is, is uh, we do have a lot of opportunity. You know, there's oftentimes where mountain biking or skiing over plants that are actually food and, and medicine sources that we're ignorant of. And, uh, and there's a lot of other opportunities, you know, and I hope I articulated that in my blog entry, you know, uh, as well as, you know, hinted to it in my chapter, but I'm really into the idea of uh, raising insects for protein and, uh, and not necessarily for us, you know, I'm not too fond of eating roly polies. I've tried it. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were, uh, you know, I said, oh, a roly poly is just a small land based lobster, right? Uh, no, it isn't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all the butter in the world won't make a roly poly taste good. <laughs> but uh, the good news is, um, my chickens love roly polies. So I don't necessarily have to eat insects, but if I could figure out how to raise insects for protein for my animals, you know, then I can turn roly polies, earwigs, and uh, soldier flies into eggs and chicken. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity that we're overlooking. And so, yeah, these are the ideas that I got to. Uh, to formalize with this publication, and I'm, you know, infinitely grateful to be uh, participating in it, and uh, and to continue this forward. You know, I I've had to scale down. I had a couple mishaps in the last year. I had to scale down my agriculture activities and focus on other things, uh, and in healing. But the good news is uh, I'm still here and I'm not, you know, in a hospital or dead, which uh, could have actually happened a couple times to me in the last year. So um, exactly. So I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a very fortunate thing that I'm here today. I could I could have been gone. 
yesterday. And it just says to me that, you know, I still and we still have work to do to create a sustainable community. And I hope this chapter inspires some some thought and ideas and action around that, because I know I'm committed to it. And if we can just get more of us committed to it, then I, I'm uh, confident that we're going to pull through all this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miguel. You know, Enrique showed his T-shirt right at the beginning. Sembrando Semillas. Here's Mr. Sembrando Semillas. Whenever people think about that project, that's Miguel Santisteban. You know, it's more, it has a double meaning. Yeah, and there, there's the semilla, basically, that it's, it's both uh, t training youth on Aseca culture, Aseca agriculture. That's what he did in Sembrando Semillas for many years. But the kids themselves are the seeds. Right, there's the evidence right there, his daughter. Okay, so the next one up uh, is an uh, intriguing title, Traditional Communal Irrigation, Historical Lineage from Persia to New Mexico, Jack Myers. Good morning. About a year and a half ago, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, I got a call from Baker Morrill. And he said, uh, UNM is doing a new book on water. And since I've worked on water projects all over the world, 25 countries, he said, you should be able to come up with some sort of idea for a water project. Well, I talked to Jose and Enrique, and they said, put together a synopsis, see where it goes from there. Well, I had no idea. I mean. I'd worked on large scale irrigation projects, in fact, the world's largest earth filled dam in Pakistan, all the way down to small scale agriculture in California. So, anyway, when I was talking to Jose yesterday, he says, uh, Why don't you just tell a story? So I said, Okay, I'm going to tell a story. Well, why would Baker Morrow call me out of the blue and ask me if I would be interested in, in being involved in a water project? Well, it turns out that Baker and I have known each other. I thought it was 53 years. He informed me today it was 55, so I got two years older today. <laughs> we were in the Peace Corps together in Somalia. Now, I originally thought I was going to Samoa, but it turned out I went to Somalia, quite a bit different. Okay, so here's our Peace Corps group. We were getting ready to go to Somalia. This is in New York. <clears throat> and uh, going from left, very left to the right. The first one there is a fellow by the name of Gilles Stockton, who is uh, a cattle rancher in Grass Range, Montana. Population, what is it, 35 and dwindling? Mm -hmm. so next is Baker and then myself. Now, what's interesting about this is that all three of us now are published authors with UNM. What a coincidence. Um, You'll also notice that in 55 years, we haven't changed a single bit. <laughs> so <clears throat> I decided that I was gonna write on Asakia since I was here in Taos and it's probably one of the most foremost places in the country that has communal agriculture. But also uh, I had spent some time doing a, a project in Oman, a feasibility study on a groundwater recharge program and had the opportunity of looking at their irrigation uh, techniques. Their um, irrigation there is called filage or plural all filage. And <clears throat> it consists of a number of wells or tapping into a spring fed uh, source, which is in some cases up to 40 miles away from where the water is used. And uh, some of the, some of the wells go down 20, 30, 40, even 100 feet. And so there's subterranean tunnels that connect uh, vertically the water source, and they're maintained on a communal basis, a participation basis, until the water reaches the surface, and then it becomes utilized uh, on a communal basis equitably. So after looking at that, I decided, well, I was gonna take a look at, is there any other 
similar type of irrigation systems in the world. And I found out that Persia, which is now called Iran, started the, uh, this type of irrigation system about 7,500 years ago. Those are called canats. Basically the same thing as the, as the um, <clears throat> irrigation systems in Oman. Now you have to realize that two things, both these countries during the summer months are hot, dry, arid. In fact, uh, in Oman, the typical cover crop are rocks, gravel, and, and sand. But also you, you travel in and you find uh, these villages that have got an incredible amount of irrigated agriculture going for them. Now, uh, one of the pictures up at the top, you can't see it, but right at the base of the mountain there, you can see like a little squiggle, okay? That is a walled village. And the water comes from the mountains there to the village itself. Now you can see there's no vegetation at all. But you go inside those little villages, walled villages, there's all kinds of stuff. They like to grow a lot of fruit crops uh, there also. Um, so as I said before, that about 7,500 years ago is when the first recorded uh, Kanats culture uh, took place. Previous to that, you know, I think that it's, it's a generalized concept now that agriculture and maybe even civilization has been pushed back about to 10,000 years, okay? So that means for 2,500 years, agriculture was predicated basically on rain-fed actual uh, production or tidal basin or small-scale irrigation coming off rivers. So in other words, agriculture went to where the water was. With the advent of canats or foliages, they were able to bring water to where they wanted to grow um, their crops. So, um, and also another thing that's interesting is that uh, it's probably the first case of geometry used because when they made these um, irrigation system, they had to drop a plumb bob down into the well, and then they had to have a gradient so they could get enough head to flow the water. So they used um, geometry back then. Also, when the water went on the fields itself, it was measured in a water clock. So there's also one of the first times that you use measured time. Now, um, from Oman, and Persia, the migration of this technology went east, west, and south, and predominantly ended up in the Arabian Peninsula, um, of which the northwest, no, northeast portion is Oman. And then it spread to North Africa. From North Africa, the Moors invaded Spain in, what was it, the eighth, the eighth century, yeah and they brought this culture to Spain. Ultimately, the Span Spaniards invaded the Americas in um, 1500, 16, 14, 1500, 1600. And they brought this culture with them. This culture now is called Asakia culture, right? And it ended up here in Taos. So my understanding is that some of the um, the Asakis here in Taos could be actually almost 400 years old. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a very old technology. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the Asakia, Afflage, Kanat culture is that it's predicated on cooperation. It's also predicated on the fact that it's, it's developed at the village level, local level. So we don't have governmental intervention. You don't have regional or state intervention. It's all done locally. Local labor, local construct, local cooperation. Um, and and I, also not only the cooperation on the sharing of the maintenance of these canals or canots, sakes, but also on sharing of the water. Now, there's, there's some misconception about asakias. Most people think of Sakias are water. They're not really, they're a conveyance system. The water flows in the conveyance system. The water is owned by the individuals of the people uh, through their water shares. Um, this is one of the few places in the country where you can have 
water rights, but you don't have particularly priority of water rights. Most other places in the country, there is priority of water rights. So if you have first priority, you get the first amount of water. In the uh, local participation aspect, everyone equitably shares in that water. Now that's a nice concept. Sometimes it doesn't work that way, but it's, that it's the principle. The, um, the interesting thing about these um, conveyance structures is that they have formed a cultural perspective. So in Persia, they talked about the Kanat culture. Here they talk about the Aseki culture. In Oman, they talk about the al culture. And it really forms what's called a human ecology. So the aspect of communal distribution of water, communal participation in utilizing that water uh, has formed acculturation. Very important to understand that very few enterprises in the world today have what's called cooperation, okay? Particularly when you're talking about primary production, which is agriculture, our most precious type of resource. So with that in mind, um, the world is now taking a greater look at the preservation of Asekias, Kanats, Alphalage, and uh, UNESCO has developed a number of historic hydraulic systems in Oman, Persia. Let me back up for a second and stating that there was at one time about 50,000 kanats used in, in a run. In fact, most of the water at the village level came from kanats. Now it's estimated about three quarters of them are still in effect. Oman, they had about 3,500 originally, and I think there's about 3,000 are still active. Now these have gone back thousands and thousands of years. They still are in effect, still utilizing the water. Another thing that's very interesting about the, the, this type of water management system is the fact that there's a lot of conservation involved in it. As you were saying that use it or lose it, that's one of the worst doctrines that ever has been formulated on, on water users. But it's the truth. If you don't use your water, you lose it. State water engineer will take it away from you. Even, even with the use it or lose it stuff, there's still a tremendous amount of conservation used in the, uh, the uh, Asakia system. Uh, most of it's gravity flow and sheet irrigation, but still it's not overused. The other thing that's very important about it is that the system itself, when you look at it in a holographic perspective, uh, contributes to groundwater recharge and also recharge from here back into the Rio Grande. Um, let's see what else. I think that's about everything I have to say on the issue itself, other than the fact that it is really a unique set of water management tools that has been in effect for many, many, many centuries. And it needs to be preserved by all costs It's my honor to close out this session and respond to a, a critique that's made sometimes that uh, against us uh, here and there that says that we romanticize uh, Asekias quite a bit. Well, you know what? We do. They're beautiful. And I would answer that with, I don't know who said it, whether it was Leopold or or uh, some abuelo from, from Taos, but, but uh, people, people defend the things that they love. And you've got to fall in love with the language to learn it really well. You've got to, uh, if you're gonna defend uh, sekyas, that, that means you love them also. So uh, this, Jose and I were wrapping up this book in a very dark time. Uh, you could see the smoke from from Mora I would blow into Albuquerque sometimes, and we'd say, "How are we gonna? What is happening? The world, uh, the world's uh, falling down around us." And we, we, we wrote, we got together and tried to see some light in the darknesses. Our prelude is called "Surviving Apocalypse." How do you survive apocalypse? Well, 
This is not the first one. There's a series of apocalypses that people in this area have survived. So that, that was a challenge. And then at the end, I, I felt compelled to, to um, remind everybody that this, uh, this business of uh, de the defense of water gets very serious very quickly. If you look at, at history, we can go back. And so I went back and, and all the targets, the two, two targets in warfare are water and food. How are you going to vanquish people if you're trying to conquer them? Take away their water, attack their food. Um, one of the earliest examples of this is the, the Roman general, uh, Scipio Amelianus, uh, who defeated Carthage. He not only defeated Carthage, he salted the fields of Carthage so no one would ever be able to live there again. That's uh, the legendary account. The barbarians attack Rome later on. Uh, what do they do? They knock out the one stone of the aqueduct. It's simple. And the Romans have nothing to drink. You fast forward the siege of Santa Fe by the Pueblo warriors uh, coming in from Pecos and all the four directions. Uh, you know, what do you do? You cut off the acequia that, that, uh, and that ended the siege pretty quickly. Um, Let's fast forward. Well, that's not even, yeah, a little, little more fast forward. 1864, General Carlton orders Kit Carson to burn the, court, the, the Navajo cornfields, to chop down and burn those, uh, those beautiful peach trees in Canyon de Chez. And the Navajos uh, give up and go on their long walk. Um, in the 1920s, and this is kind of a de-romanticizing thing, in the 1920s, there was a, a German chemist whose name I will not repeat, uh, weaponized poison gases for use in World War I. He had to leave Germany. Where did he go? Spain, a neutral country. He kept working. He kept working, improving his gases. Uh, later on in World War II, he's the guy that, that invented uh, Zyklon B for the extermination camps. In Spain, he was a national hero. They give him ticker tape parades in the wars of liberation of what they used to call Spanish Morocco, a very vicious war that my own grandfather was drafted into and fled to Mexico, the, the, the country that saved our family. Um, what happened there? Uh, terrible things on both sides. The, a whole garrison of Spanish soldiers was captured. And these are Muslims, and you, you're, it's, it's not right to just shoot another person. you, you got to do it halal style. So they killed 2,000 Spanish soldiers and bled them out by cutting their throats, just like they were sheep, right? Uh, Spain responded because it had planes and gassed many villages. Entire villages were gassed. And this guy developed the best poisons for acequias and... and um, uh, oases. You, you, you drop a bomb, uh, one of these uh, bomb bomblets in an oasis, and it kills every plant, every fish. If a sheep drinks from it, the sheep dies. If a person uh, drinks from it, the person dies. These are crimes of Spain, you know, the great fatherland of uh, Asequias. These are crimes of Spain. The world was shocked, so shocked that in 1925, right after that war, they called a convention in Geneva and it, many, many countries signed it and resolved that chemical weapons would never again be used against civilians. And that, that convention is still cited today. But what was the reason for that? Spain was the reason for that, right? Let's de-romanticize this business. Um, move a little bit forward to the Kanats. What happened to the Kanats? First, the Soviet bombers just blast the hell out of them. Then the American bombers come in and blast the hell out of them, but they're underground. So uh, three quarters of them survived this. And everything that's on the surface um, in Afghanistan only 20, it, it is working at 25% capacity with all these people to feed. And let's, let's uh, go to this, the slides. This is, these are from, um, 
this is the other, so I need to mention Esteban Arellano, who's no longer with us. This is his line of research that, that I continued and, and put in a chapter with both our names on it. It's another lineage. We know stuff is coming in from North Africa, as Jack was saying, but uh, Esteban knew there was something about the, um, not the Almoravides, who were the ones in Arabia Felix, I'll think of their names uh, in a minute. This is Happy Arabia, the only place that has actual uh, precipitation, right? Everything else is water mines. A kanat is, is oftentimes a water mine that goes underground and, and uh, to where the agriculture is. And in uh, the capital, in the second caliphate, the capital is up in Damascus, but the, 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 no, the nobility, the, the riches are down in Arabia Felix, uh, today known as Yemen. And when the, when the second caliphate crashes, uh, the, the nobility has to leave. And you've heard of Sabah, the kingdom of Sabah. It's Sheba in the Bible. It's the kingdom of Sheba. They have their own language the Sabaean language, no longer spoken, but it's in family names and it's in place names. So uh, where did they go? Where did these people go? They went straight to Cordoba. They went straight to Cordoba and they, they were able to set up uh, uh, another, did they set up a, a caliphate there? Eventually, I think they did. And they brought all this language, Siasekia, uh, Noria, uh, all of those words are, are not originally Arabic words. They, they come from the Sabaean language and they were adapted into Arabic when the people in Arabia Felix were so sick of the wars that the Christians and, 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 and the Jews were fighting down there uh, that the Christians were across the Red Sea in Ethiopia, right? And they got so sick of them that Islam was really truly the, the religion of peace. That, uh, that came to Arabia Felix. And, and so everybody speaks Arabic there now. And as we see in the next slide, along the Red Sea, there's a tremendous uh, system of terraced agriculture. They, they get every single drop of water that comes uh, from the mist and a little bit of, there's a little bit of a monsoon that, that goes in there. They catch every bit. This is where coffee comes from, right? Um, mangoes uh, do very well here that when they were brought in from, from India. I don't think there's quite enough to do rice, but there's an amazing variety of crops. Uh, and this is, these are UNESCO landscapes, um, well worth visiting. And the next slide, Esteban Arellano wasn't aware of, of this place, um, the Suthmari, because uh, he... His, his research was cut short when he went away a few years ago. And he said, well, uh, the, the Yemenis have this, this wonderful small scale terrace agriculture uh, and the Romans had a bigger, bigger scale water management with their aqueducts and stuff. But, but guess what? They, they didn't do dams. The Romans just did little tiny dams for their aqueducts. And this is a huge dam. This was as big as Kochiri Dam. It was an earthen dam with a, with a masonry uh, floodgate. And it, it captured water that had a whole irrigation district below it that lasted a thousand years. This, this system was overwhelmed by a huge flood in, um, in the eighth century. So it's been gone a long time and all of the centuries have their inscriptions and stuff on these walls of the head gate. What happens in Yemen? Our planes, our bombs, our gas, our service crews, refueling those planes, our planes bombed this place. They said it was a military target. They blew it apart. There's a good part of it, you know, maybe it can be reconstructed. They bombed those terraces that you saw on the other thing. These are crimes against humanity. There are crimes. Those are, th these are connected to us. And yes, we defend water. The defense gets heated. 
I'm, I'm very upset by this. There's a truce now. There's a truce and, and they're trying to work it out. You know, what's going on between the Shias and the Sunnis? You know, uh, Muhammad, uh, peace be on his name, I don't think would have been too happy about any of this, right? But uh, it attracted the attention of the UN that did not even need to mention the name of this country, Saudi Arabia. They didn't even, because everybody knew it was happening. This is 2018 Security Council Resolution 2417, which calls on all parties of the United Nations to take, and I quote, constant care to spare civilian objects, including objects necessary for food production and distribution, such as farms, markets, water systems, mills, food processing and storage sites and hubs and means for food transportation and refraining from attacking, destroying, removing and rendering useless objects that are indispensable to the survival of the civilian population, such as foodstuffs, crops, livestock, agricultural assets, drinking water installations and supplies and irrigation works. This is the UN asking all of the world to, to to, to bring this to our attention and work through our political process to, to end this conflict by any means possible. Did they really need to bomb every hospital? Did they really need to bomb every school? Did they need to bomb this dam? No. God damn it. Uh, el agua se defiende. No? El agua no se vende, but the defense of water is, is something very serious and and we are water defenders here. All these asequeros, uh, we love uh, irrigating in the moonlight. We love it and we defend it. So, con eso, gracias. I want to thank our library staff because I couldn't do this without this team. We have Kayla played off in the back, Dave Mansfield, Bob Bocake, keeping this IT going. Um, Madeline Gonzalez is keeping the library going. I want to thank our digital media arts. This is the skills that our students have learned. Um, they're using it right here today. Most of all, I want to thank Enrique and Jose for making a trip up to Taos and sharing this enlightening piece of work. You know, we all run around saying, agua es vida. Well, it's, it is a very important thing to discuss, and that's what we're doing here today, discussing how we get our water. Um, again, many of us have, have, here have known the late Esteban Arellano, and I read recently that he refers to this knowledge as a sequia literacy. And as I mentioned earlier, Olivia Romo po uh, points to the literacy of the land. So as the library director here, I hope you're all leaving here today with a little, being a little bit more literate of the land in our sequias. If so, then we've succeeded. Thank you. Have a great day, and please come see our library.